structures today are completely gone. The, and the, the street level, as I said, 42 feet high. Jessica. And uh, uh, buildings have been built right up against the northern sector of the wall, blocking it off. A huge earthen ramp blocked this southern part of the wall. So the only accessible part is between those buildings and the ramp, a 197-foot section that we commonly call the Wailing Wall. That is the most sacred piece of real estate for Jewish people today. It is the closest that the Muslims will allow them to come to pray and worship to the spot their ancient temple once stood, uh, the Wailing Wall. Today the Jews refer to it as the Western Wall. Last time I was in Israel, I mistakenly referred to it as the Wailing Wall to our tour group. A Jewish tour guide very graciously corrected me. I uh, told him I knew better with your slip of the tongue. He said, true story. He said, don't worry, we do it all the time because we do have a wailing wall here in Jerusalem. I said, really? Where is it? And he said, down at our local IRS office. <laughs> that is a true wailing wall. The beautiful palace on the edge of the upper city built by those Jewish Maccabean kings, their royal palace, a beautiful structure, but it paled when compared to Herod's palace who loved to build and he was good at it. He truly was the most gifted architect of the ancient world. Built things then we would have great difficulty duplicating today with all of our modern technology. The three towers built to fortify the wall. They were named in honor of people. The first was the Tower of Phaseal, named after Herod's brother, a man who committed suicide by beating his head with a rock. Had to be a horrible way to die. The middle tower was the Tower of Hippicus, named after Herod's best friend, a man killed in battle. The third, the Tower of Mary Amne, the second of Herod's ten wives. Herod kept putting his wife to death, Mary Amne, no exception, even though she was his favorite. Cruel man, Herod, killed the babies in Bethlehem, trying to kill Jesus, killed ten of his wives, killed several of his grown sons. They were more popular with the people. He was afraid they might usurp his throne, so he had them assassinated. When Herod was dying, he had 300 of the most powerful, prominent, and popular Jewish men throughout the land of Judea arrested. All 300 of those Jews were imprisoned here in the Hippodrome where they had athletic events. Herod left instructions that on the day he died, all 300 Jews were to be executed immediately upon his own death. And he did it for one reason. He wanted to know that when he died, the people would not be celebrating. Rather, there would be weeping and mourning throughout the land, even though he knew it would not be for him. That was Herod. He ruled for 36 very long and very bloody, bloody years. The night Jesus was betrayed, he and the disciples made their way into the wealthy section of the upper city to the upper room. Ate the Passover meal, Jesus instituted the communion service. Incredible events happened in that room that night. When they had finished, Jesus and the disciples left the city over to the Mount of Olives and to the Garden of Gethsemane. Betrayed and arrested, Jesus is brought back up into the upper city, first to the house of Annas, who had been the high priest. Still the power behind the office, a brief but illegal trial transpires. Then he is taken to the palace of Caiaphas, the current high priest, and another illegal trial. Still in the middle of the night, Jesus is brought to the house of Hewn Stone, where the Sanhedrin had been hastily and illegally assembled. They present their evidence and take a vote against their own Jewish law. Nevertheless, that illegal vote said he must be put to death. Only the Romans could do that, so he's taken to the fortress to where Pontius Pilate, the Roman procurator, was staying for Passover. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of visitors and pilgrims have come for Passover. Uh, Conditions right for rioting. Pilate is here to keep the peace. First thing to bring him in is Jesus of Nazareth. He wants the volatile situation off his hand before he erupts into a citywide riot. When he learned that Jesus was originally from the northern region of Galilee, and he knows that the ruler of Galilee is also in Jerusalem for Passover week, staying at that beautiful Maccabean palace, his name is Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great. He is the Herod who beheaded John the Baptist. Pilate said this man, Jesus is a Galilean, will send him to the Tetrarch of Galilee. Herod is anxious to see Jesus. He's here at Passover to party and have a good time. He wants Jesus to entertain him by performing some of the miracles he had heard of him doing in Galilee as if they were magic trick. Jesus won't buy into that foolishness. 
Herod had Jesus beaten and returned to Pilate, who releases a prisoner named Barabbas. Great irony in the name Barabbas. It comes from two Aramaic words, and it literally means the son of the father. The very thing you remember, Jesus was condemned to die for claiming to be the son of the heavenly father. Barabbas, his first name, by the way, was Jesus. Jesus Barabbas. Jesus, the son of the father. What an amazing coincidence. Our Lord is taken to the praetorium at the fortress. The Roman soldiers torment, torture, find him. They scourge him. And when he brought back out to the crowd, his body so mangled that it is hardly recognizable as human. Nevertheless, they cry out, crucify him. He's taken from the fortress. The Gospel of John records that he, bearing his cross, came to the place of the skull, which he called in the Hebrew tongue, Golgotha. And they're the absolutely perfect, the sinless, the only uh, innocent man, the only true. Uh, Son of the true and living God, nailed to a cross, crucified.